Pastor Cunningham, he, he, he had that heart. He wants to see us grow. And he wants to see us be able to speak. And I know for, for me personally, I know he always telling me anytime somebody call you to speak, if the Holy Spirit leads you, you go. Because that's what God called you to do. And I thank God for you all for last week, for your prayers, because I was at my home church last week, and the God called me there to preach, and I had that opportunity to do that, and I thank God for it. And I want to thank each and every one of you again. First, let me put it this way. For the ones that don't come to Bible study on Wednesday night, and we had prayer and worship last Wednesday night, you miss a treat. I'm going to tell you, we had a fireball good time up in here. The prayers that was lifted up, the praises that was lifted up, and the testimonies that was given were just extremely awesome. And I thank God for that. Um, I'm going to mention this part with that. Um, something we should have been doing, we didn't do. But I believe from this point on, we will do. And we will start, if it's all right with the church and everybody, we will take videos. We don't, we'll take DVDs of it. So the ones that can come, if you want to see what's going on, you can get you a DVD. Amen? Because I'm going to tell you, we had a good time up in here. And, I, and if y'all see me beside myself today, it's not because I'm trying to show out, because I don't show out for nobody. It's because that what went on Wednesday night is still going on in me today. Amen? And, you know, you may say, well, we just went through the book of song two weeks ago, the 23rd song. But sometimes we have to go back to come forward. And so God placed that back in my spirit again. Let's do this again, the 23rd song. And I'm going to share this 23rd song with you. And we're going to put a little twist on it. I want you to make it personal. Amen? Let's go to the throne of grace. Heavenly Father, we praise you and we glorify you now. We thank you, Father God, for what you're going to do. We thank you for what you have already done. Now, Father, as we enter into your word, we ask you, Father God, to open our hearts and our minds that we may see what you are saying to glorify you and honor you in each and everything that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, we identify a lot of things in life. We go through life all the time identifying different things. Matter of fact, I'm, uh, you know, when you're looking for vehicles, you identify the type of vehicle that you want. You know, you may say, I want me a Chevrolet. I want a, this model of Chevrolet. But then you get to the point that you want to start describing that particular Chevrolet. Well, I want these features in that Chevrolet. I want me, I want to have a GPS in it. I want to make sure I got a nice radio. I want to make sure I got AC in it. I want to make, have all these different types of features. So what we do, we identify it, and then we describe it. We do that with people. Right now, somebody can ask you, who is John Witherspoon? You can tell him, well, he's an associate at Progressive Believers Baptist Church. He's yay tall, he's yay wide. And don't get my weight to him now. Don't, you know, don't you know, leave that part of it alone. So, you know, he's trying to stout us up. Don't say he's fat, you know? You know but the point is, we, we identify things and we describe it. You know, even right now, if we was in, in another country and we show somebody our dollar, they said at the United States dollar bill. Then we can describe it because of what's on that dollar bill. You know, we look at it, well, say there's an emblem on it, a triangle, then we can say that there's an eye on it, we can say there's an eagle on it, it's green. I mean, we do all of this. And when I was thinking about this, I thought about David. When David started with the 23rd Psalm, the first thing David started off, he said that the Lord is. He identified who the Lord is to him. He was identifying that the Lord is one that had power and authority in his life. So, I just, so when I titled this, I titled, I say, how do you identify and describe your Lord? Yours. How do you do it? How do you identify the Lord that you serve? And how do you describe him? Who is he to you? David said his Lord was a shepherd, you know? And see, David could say that he used the character of a shepherd because this is something that he knew about. He knew what it took to take care of the sheep. He knew exactly what the sheep it needed because by him being a shepherd, he knew what it took. He knew what he had to do. 
So in that case, David went on, David looked at this, he said, now, for the Lord to be my shepherd, that means that he's over me. He have authority over me. He is in a position to basically to call all the shots in my life. He took, in other words, he was saying that I have come in a submission to my shepherd. I have come into mission, and I have surrendered my whole life to the shepherd. And basically, when you look at the sheep, that's what the sheep do. And in the book of John, we say that we are sheep. You know, and God and Jesus Christ is our shepherd. So are we, have we surrendered to him? Have you surrendered to Jesus Christ? I'm not, you know, I'm not speaking of the point of view to where you raise your hand and you say, you know, you come down and all this, yeah, I accept the Christ as my personal Savior, and you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and you be baptized, and after you be baptized, what do you do? Do you make a commitment? Do you begin to start serving God? Asking God what did he want to do in your life? See, one thing about a, a, a sheep, that shepherd keep him in line. So they know exactly what they, where they're going because they're going to follow that shepherd. So David went on, and as he went on into this, I'm going to explain this thing to you slowly this day. Because David said, I, he wants for nothing. And in the process of wanting from anything, not wanting anything at all, you know you're going to be taken care of. And as you're being taken care of, you know for one thing that, that your shepherd is not going to give you anything that is not good for you. Excuse me one minute. Can you all put that up? On the board for me, please. Can you put the scripture up? Thank you. Okay. And as he, he, he does this, he knows for a fact that in the process that you would not go without water, you would not go without food, and in our life we would not go without clothing. But there's another part that all of us. In the New Living Translation it says he's, he, he give you Took you by a green metal land where a lot of proteins, nutrition is in it. Are you getting your nutrition? Are you getting your proteins from the Word of God? Are you growing in God's Word? Are you developing a relationship that when you sit down and start studying God's Word, you can start feeling a change in your life? You can know that you're getting the proper vitamins that you need each and every day when you study God's Word? Or do you have an opportunity where you feel like you don't have to study God's word today because I studied it yesterday? Or do you think that, well, I don't have to go to my medicine cabinet today because, you know, I went there yesterday to get some patients, so I still should have some today. But he said, he also tells us, he said, he take you by a, 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 a place, a, a stream, a peaceful stream, where there's comfort, where you can relax, where you can lie there still and don't have to worry about nothing harming you. Nothing coming up against you. But see, let's go back to the word. Even in the process of the word, if you don't have the word in you, how can you be comfortable in God's word? If you're not studying and sharing God's word with others, how can you be comfortable? How can, when something come up against you, how can you place it with God's word or speak it out God's word when you don't know it? So we need to be in the process, when we go by, when we start studying God's word and we start looking into God's word, we should ask God for a revelation. We should ask God to, to show us what he's saying, give us some understanding. So we'll be able to be able to receive his word and to be able to share his word with others. Because we're all supposed to be disciples of Christ. I can't disciple nobody if I don't know the word. You know, we are the salt of the earth. How can I season somebody? If I don't even have no salt, you know, if I'm the light of the world, how can I, my light shine, you know, and if I got a bush over it, or I got cover covering it, you can't even see the light. And the reason you can't see the light, because you're not studying and allowing God's light to glow through you. We have to allow ourselves to meditate in God's word. You know, we're soaked into the word of God, you know. We could read the Bible every day and get up the same way we started because we didn't ask God to do nothing for us. So how can we, you know, get, be nourished in his word? We want the word to just be there. And see, when you have the word in you, 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 you can walk in this world peaceful. Yes, things are going to come up against us, 
But see, one thing about it, I got something to stand on. If you don't have the word planted in you, you don't have anything to stand on. And that's one of the things that we always should have. Then we've got to trust in God's word. We have to believe what God say. And we have to understand that. And see, God also told us, he said, I will guide you along a right path. Now, when somebody guiding you, they directing you. The Holy Spirit is our guide. You know, when he's beginning to guide us, he's leading us in a direction that he wants us to go. God is not going to lead us in a bunch of conflict. You see, he already told us in his word, he's not the author of confusion. So when you start getting into conflicts about all those it's, us, and those other things that we get into conflicts about, you know what you can say to yourself? That ain't God. I don't need to be in all that conflict. He didn't lead you into that. You led yourself into it. You know, he gave you the right direction to go into, but we choose to go over here. He tells us to lead not to our own understanding, but in everything, acknowledge him. Now, a lot of times we want to go ahead and just don't want to acknowledge God to the fullness. We acknowledge God when we want to. You know, that's what I mean by the fullness. Because we acknowledge God to the fullness, before we enter into something, we be praying. So we go into it, we know for a fact that God is in the midst of it. You know, I have gone into different places. And when I got there, I said the first thing I sat down and I looked, I said, Lord, please help me. I Because the first thing, when I walked in the building, I didn't like what I saw. And I had to move self out of the way. And I had to let the Lord just guide me through those. Because I would end up not being led by the Holy Spirit, but being led by John Witherspoon. And that ain't no good confusion. You know, that's a bunch of conflict, you know. And we all know it. Because we all have been led in directions. And we, when we got back out of those directions, we found ourselves in check. We said to ourselves, Lord, I sure hate I done that. Please forgive me. But if we allow the Holy Spirit to direct us, we want to win into those conflicts. Then we come to the part that he talks about. He said, he's, he brings honor to his name. When we trust God and we are doing what God has called us to do. See, when David was talking about he don't want for nothing, he was honoring God's name because he knew that God would supply all his needs. He didn't have to worry about anything tomorrow. Because he knew that God already had his plans for his life for tomorrow. He already knew that. You know, he didn't, and David understand what it means to cast his cares upon God. Because he knew that God cared for him. And see, that's where we need to be at in our walk with Christ. We need to understand how to cast each and every one of our cares upon him. Because he's waiting for us. God is he's there with open arms telling us to cast it all to him. And we get to the point that we want to worry about what's going to happen tomorrow? What is he? Well, it's going to be a tornado tomorrow. Let me run down here and get a bunch of bread and milk and everything else so I can be ready for this tornado. And at the same time, we need to be focusing on God. Now, I'm not saying don't be, don't, let's don't be foolish because he gave us wisdom. But we still have to focus on God. Amen? Then we come to the part that we, he said that, and I love this part because in the Bible study, I, I, I title as being obedient. He said, even though I walked through the valley of darkness, distraction is a part of darkness. Materialistic things that where you have to just gather a whole bunch of material stuff. You got to have it. You know, I, I, I share this about how we have so much clothes and and we don't even need all those clothes that we have. You know, some of we have had for months and years, and, and we still have them. Instead of we share it with somebody else. I ain't giving nobody to us. This is mine. And they ain't doing sitting right there, in the, right there in your closet, rotting it up. Moss, just eating it all up. But we got it. Materialistic things. You know, you got so much, I call it junk around your house. You know, that's all they just pile up there. And you, you, don't, you don't want to do nothing with it. And there's other people out there need what you have. And we're so selfish that we're holding on to it. And you go ask somebody for it, the first thing they ask you, right, what are you going to give me for it? God bless you with it. You ain't using it. Let somebody else have it. You know, we, we don't supposed to be selfish Christians. We're supposed to be givers. You know, 
That's, what, that's the thing that we're we supposed to do. That will separate us from the world. We are givers. One of my biggest things is I don't loan you money. I gives you money. Now, I'm not saying that for y'all coming to ask me for no money because I don't have no money now. I'm going to tell you that now. I'm not rich. And all the rich I'm in is in Christ Jesus. That's my riches. You know, that's my riches. So don't come up here and start asking me for no two or three, four hundred dollars, a thousand dollars. I'm going well, I'm sorry. You know, I'm like, I wish I had to give it, but I don't. But I don't, I do not loan people money. I'll give it to you because I don't want you ducking and dodging me. You know, the conversation, the relationship that we used to have, now we don't have it because every time you come around, you're thinking that I'm going to ask you about the money. Or you embarrassed because I didn't give it to you and you don't know how to come back and approach me, so you just stay away. You know, so we should get to that point, materialistic thing. Then we have this relationship. Some relationships are so much in darkness. Divorces are one of the worst things that we can, we can go through. We don't even hurt ourselves, but if there's kids involved in the relationship, you hurt the kids, you know, because they have to, all, everybody has to restruct their whole entire lives. You know, their life start out like this as a, as a unit, then it become like that. So now you have to restruct that whole thing. And in the process of doing all that, you get to the point that whether or not you start, you start holding yourself guilty or you hold the other person guilty, and you start beholding them guilty because of what they've done, but you really never sit back and look at yourself. See, it's a two-party trip. You know, you didn't marry yourself. It was two of y'all got married. And the thing about it, anytime you go through a divorce or anything, you need to look at, yes, he may, he may have gone out there and committed adultery. Yes, you may have gone out there and committed adultery. But you ever thought about what led him out there? What sent him in that direction? Or sent her in that direction? What changed your lifestyle that caused these things to happen? Well, so a lot of times they say, well, he, they been, well, you put it on the man. So that's the first thing everybody say. Uh, well, anyway, he been a dog anyway. Well, you, if you knew he was a dog, why you married a dog? You know, let's be real about it. You know, you're saying that what he was to start off with, so why do you marry a dog? But the point is, you have to understand that as a relationship, if God put you together, God put you together for a reason. Because that's who you're supposed to be with. God's supposed to be able to work. He can and he will if you allow him to work any and everything out in your life and in your marriages. You know? But you have to work. We don't have to work through some things. Now, in the biblical days, they were putting wives away for everything. She got too fat. She don't look as pretty as she used to look. She's not doing the things I tell her to do. So they got a divorce. All those different things. Little, little small things. But God told you, he said, he hates divorces. So we're supposed to work things out. You know? Amen. Then he tell us, he say, well, you are close beside me. Even when I'm in the midst of that valley, God is close there beside me. God is right there. Even when I'm going through certain things in my life, God is there. Even when I'm, I'm having problems and I don't know how to work it out. God is there. Even though when I'm, I'm sitting there all alone, don't feel like nobody in this world loves me, God is there. Even when the nights are dark and, and things just seem like they're falling apart, God is there. Even when I lost my job and I don't know where the next paycheck will come from, God is there. It doesn't matter what I go through. God is right there. You know, even when the, the, my church family, and we, we do that sometimes, have turned our back on us. God is still there, right there. God tells us, he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And you know, we have to stand on that, knowing that. Yes, there are times where I may feel like God has left me. There may, I may feel forsaken. But the point is, is this, knowing and trusting and obeying God, I know he's there. Knowing he's right there. And he tells us, he says, my rod and my staff, they comfort you. And protect you. You know, with God's rod, and we talk about it, we describe it as an instrument for defense and offense to defend yourself. But see, I don't have to fight a battle because I already have victory in Jesus Christ. So see, my rod now belongs to Jesus. He is my rod. 
Because, see, he, he protects me from all hurt, harm, and danger. So he stands before me through all my battles. Regardless of what I'm going through, I know Jesus has it. When he, raised, he was, when he rose from the grave, he came up with all power in his hand. So with him having all power in his hand, and I'm a part of his, I'm a, his child, that means that he has protected, he's protecting me. So is Jesus your rod? Is he your rod? And the staff that guides me, because that's what we use the staff for, to keep the sheep in line. To keep him going in the direction that you want him to go. So the Holy Spirit, as I study God's word, and I, I sometimes I want to lean to my own understanding, and the Holy Spirit bring me back into conviction, and I get back in line. Or when I'm studying God's word, and I'm sitting back just thinking about how wonderful God's word is to me, the Holy Spirit reveal it to me and say, yes, you're lining up with God's word. Or when I want to do something, I say, you know, I think this is a good program for the church, or I may think this is a, a good ministry that I want to be involved in, the Holy Spirit tells me whether or not I should be a part of it or I should leave it alone. It may look good, it may sound good, but if the Holy Spirit don't say, don't line me up with it, then it's not for me. Amen. Too often time we don't listen to the Holy Spirit, that staff that's trying to line us back up. Just because of the part of the uh, a congregation or a spiritual uh, program, we feel that that's a part that we need to be involved in. The Holy Spirit may say no. Amen. See, that's one of the things that I love about Progressive. There's certain programs and things that we talk to the pastor about or, or talk to our care groups about, and it tells them that care group come together, and when they come together, they start discussing it, and you can see whether they're going to line up with Progressive. Every ministry and every program don't line up with Progressive. And see, if you walk in, in the Holy Spirit, and you let the Holy Spirit guide you, you know what this is for Progressive, this is not for Progressive. And that's a blessing, knowing that you have been walking with the Holy Spirit and it lined you up with what's going on in the church that God has given you the fellowship in. That he calls us and he said that, well, I mean, that's a blessing to know that. He said, I prepare a table for you in the presence of my enemy. <laughs> Y'all can think about how wonderful it's going to be when we all get to heaven. And they're judging the unrighteous. And you know where they're going and here all them days and all that time you have went through all these things you've gone through. That person over there didn't like you. And he see you sitting at that table. Mm. I don't know you, but that's a joy to me. Amen. Knowing that one day I'm going to be able to sit down with my Savior face to face. And we're going to have a meal together. Even now today, when my enemies see me, they can see what God is doing in my life. When they see you, they can see what God is doing in your life. The ones that have tried to backstab you, the ones who gossip about you, guess what? And they see you still walking faithful in the Lord. They even what God is preparing inside of you. Because remember I told you just a minute ago, we are the light of the world. And we are the salt. They see that. Your enemies see how you season in somebody else. They see how the God is showing you. You know, one of the biggest things is when you can forgive somebody, that really have crossed you, and someone else over to tell you, they ain't worth a nickel. They ain't no good. And they see at the same time that you blessing somebody else. I forgive you what you've done to me. Yes, it was wrong. I didn't like it. But one thing about it, the love that I have for my Lord and Savior, I can forgive you. That's a blessing. That's how somebody else knows that you're in Christ. You know, and that's one of the things that we always have to do. It's not so much about always the forgiving part, but just showing love to somebody else. I mean, you got people out there just don't like you because who you are. You know, who you think you are to me, you serve a holy and righteous God. Who say that God is that good, but they can see that everything about you have changed. And that's the difference. And God is trying to prepare you. And your enemy can see all of that. And that's a blessing. Amen? Then he tells us one of the greatest things that I always love about this. He said, I honor you. You honor me by anointing my head with all. Mm. When we accepted Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, he separated us from the world. 
he tells us in the book of John, he said we are, as a matter of fact, the 17th chapter, he tells us, he said, we are in the world, but we are not of the world. So that's a blessing, knowing that you are separated. And let's show you what even blessing more than that. You are separated from the things that you used to do, the people that you used to associate with, the places you used to go. You have, God has separated you from those things. Now, let me just give you a little twist on that, too. He separated you, but some of us are so big and bad, we have gone back to it. You know, there's some things God has separated us from. We have took upon ourselves, and we're struggling now trying to get back, and we wonder why. Because of disobedience. Not saying that God can't bring you back, because God has all power. But what about the sincereness of your heart of coming back? See, one thing about the Lord, I, I love that because I know when he anointed me with all, he separated me from the things of the world. We all have been separated from those things of the world. You know, I don't have to worry about things being taken care of. Because when I accepted Christ and he separated me, he told me he would supply all my needs. He told me he's going to take care of me. And I believe that. I stand on that. I have faith knowing and trusting and obeying God when God would do exactly what he said. His word said well, he would not come back to him void. So that means that he ain't gonna, if his word go back to him, that means everything will be destroyed. What a blessing. And he said, my cup's running over. What do you want? What do you want? What do you need? You have eternal life. You know, you have that. You have clothes on your back. Some of us got a few dollars in the bank. Some of us are blessed to be able to retire. Some of us have two and three and four cars parking in our yard. We got a shelter. Our bills are being paid. So what do we need? Only thing you need is a closer walk with Jesus. That's all we need. To stay connected to him. Don't allow nothing to shake us. Remove us from his presence. Just keep us wrapped in his arm. So we don't need anything. You know, we all do, that's the only thing we have to do. But you know, it says surely. When I look at this word surely, without doubt, or be having confidence. I don't have no doubt in my mind that God is not going to do what he said he's going to do. Everything he has written in his book, I believe that he will do it. I trust him and I stand on it. You know, the thing about that, knowing that God said his goodness And in this version, the New Living Translation say, and his unfailing love. Mm. In other words, it will always be there. Now you tell me, where's your doubt? Why do we doubt him? He said it, and I believe it. Do you believe it? That his goodness? The King James Version says his mercy will be there. But this is a part I like more than this whole script, and I like James, I like David, how he, 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 he outlined and described his shepherd, how he loved his shepherd. He noticed how he cared about his shepherd. But the question came about, and the question was, how do you identify and describe your Lord? I'll give you an understanding of how David did. As we read the 23rd Psalm, you see how he identified his Lord. Well, let me, I'm going to do one thing here. And I'm going to share with you how I identify my Lord. First thing, he's my shepherd. He's my savior. He's my deliverance. He's my joy. He's my hope. He's my peace. He's my comforter. He's the bread of life to me. He is everything that I know him to be. 
He is my strength. In the midst of darkness, he walks with me. He is even to all that I believe, he even the truth. He is my way out of everything. But most of all, he's my savior. And what really brings me to Jesus knowing him the way that I know him, he's my creator. On another version, he says he's my mecca. And then at the same time, I look at him as being my peace. And at the same time, I look at him as being my comforter. See, it doesn't matter what I go through in life, I have a name for my Lord. See, that, see when I'm feeling bad, he's my doctor. And see, there are times in my life when I, I may be broke and I find out he's my provider. Even when the storms are rough in my life and I don't have no way to turn, I can look at him and say, he's my shelter. He covers me. So see, when I really think about who Jesus is, my Lord is, I can say that he is my all in all. But then on the other hand, I can look at him and say, he is the great I am. See, one thing about it, that's why the question came about, who is he to you? How do you identify him? How do you describe him? And that's the thing, that's what makes it so personal. Who is he? Who is he? You know, I can tell you, I can tell you, he's the word that I eat. He's the one I soak into. I bathe into his word. I can say every now and then, he's the one that I smother myself in. He's my season. Because sometimes the word don't taste the same. Sometimes it convicts me I want to spit it out. Then sometimes it's sweeter than honey. You know? Then sometimes it's just like milk. It just is nice and cool going down. So the question is, how do you, not John, but how do you identify and describe your Lord? And the church say, God bless you. God bless you. Come on.